Okay. Hi everyone, I'm Melanie, and today I'll be talking about what progressive web applications are, why we should care about them, and how they work under the hood. So by the end of this presentation, you should have some sense of um, the priorities of progressive web applications and how they're compatible with the particular tech stack that we've been working with, uh, as well as some options for optimizing the performance of the kinds of applications that we're developing. So the idea of a progressive web application emerged fairly recently. The term was coined in 2015 by a designer named Francis Berryman and a Google engineer named Alex Russell. And it was intended um, as one approach to the problem of loading web applications for users with bad connectivity, whether it's because the user is like riding the subway or using an outdated device or living in a country with insufficient infrastructure. It's worth quickly noting that um, these apps usually have mobile users in mind but the strategies that they'll use to optimize the application's performance uh, is applicable in all browser contexts, so they're absolutely of interest to us. So to provide a really basic definition, we can say that progressive web applications are apps that approach questions of design and development using the principle of progressive enhancement. So what is progressive enhancement? Uh, this, on the other hand, is a really old idea. It's from about a decade and a half ago when web content was just starting to shift from simple static pages into something more interactive. Basically, progressive enhancement involves writing web applications that are functional at a baseline level without JavaScript and which are then progressively enhanced or hydrated sometimes with more and more functionality, depending on what's supported in the browser, the stability and speed of the internet connection, and so on. Uh, so these days we're less worried about like users who don't have JavaScript enabled in their browser, but again, um, we'll still get a lot of benefits from this kind of paradigm. So this is an, imaging of, an image of what progressive rendering might look like. Um, it's just a kind of abstraction of the browser window. The leftmost column represents the page at zero seconds in, right when it started rendering. And the final column shows the page when it's fully rendered, maybe like a second and a half or two seconds in, um, ideally. So as we can see with progressive rendering, the time to first paint is much faster with stuff above the fold getting rendered way before the unoptimized site. There are a few different ways to make this happen um, and some approaches have the drawback of resulting in a kind of uncanny valley of the internet where it looks like the page is alive and it looks like it's fully loaded but you can't actually interact with it yet. Um, but anyway, this is the general idea and we can talk about the implementation in a second. So in addition to using progressive enhancement, progressive web applications have a set of core characteristics and the most prominent ones are listed here. So progressive web applications are responsive, that is they can adapt according to different viewport sizes, uh, desktop, mobile, tablet, et cetera. They're less reliant on connectivity, that is they preserve some functionality even with a slow connection or in offline mode. They're app-like, uh, which means they use single page navigation the way a user would expect. And on a related note, they're often installable and linkable, meaning that you can actually store it on the home screen, home screen of your device, uh, but also share it as a URL. Uh, they're discoverable because they have a manifest, which shows up in web searches. And finally, they're secure, which we'll discuss in a second. For a longer and more detailed list of these characteristics, um, you can check out a tool called Google Lighthouse. It's an open source tool that you can run on any web page, either as a Chrome extension or from the command line and it gives you a report on how well a site does according to these metrics. Um, again, a lot of the Lighthouse checks specifically are designed with mobile development in mind, but they give really good data on a site's performance as well. So I ran Lighthouse on our Google, or on our Grace Shopper website, and the results were a little grim. <laughs> so <laughs> you can see that the time between the first meaningful paint and the first interactivity is like 20 milliseconds which is bad because it means that the user spends a huge amount of time with a screen that's basically blank. We aren't rendering anything progressively. I also ran it on the Grace Hopper website for fun. Um, that's on the top of this slide. And here we do get actually a measurably faster first initial paint. And then I ran it on the bottom of the slide on the New York Times mobile website, just as, as an example of something that loads like as much static content as fast as possible, and then takes a very progressive approach to rendering interactive features. It's very fast in its first paint though. It gets a green arrow. So what would we do to implement a progressive web application? We've seen a list of their characteristics, but there are four key things uh, that we need to do to make this work. So first of all, um, a progressive web application needs to originate from a secure connection, 
meaning we have to serve it over TLS using the HTTPS, pro HTTPS protocol. This is because um, progressive web ac applications use something called service workers, which are more susceptible to man-in-the-middle attacks. Um, second of all, we need a web app manifest and an icon. Again, these are more important for mobile platforms, but they're worth taking a peek at. Um, that's what a web app manifest would look like. It's basically just a JSON object that stores metadata about the app. Um, and it has a few required properties, a name, a short name, uh, a start or home URL, and info about the display, as well as links to the web icon. And the app manifest is really good for making an application mobile responsive because it can give you a splash screen using stuff like the background color, the theme of the site, and the icons so that it looks like something is loading even when nothing is happening in the background. And it makes your web app feel like native. Um, then finally, back to implementation. Um, the last thing we need are these tools that let the app function offline or when connectivity is low. And these include an application shell and service workers. And these are basically the nuts and bolts of our functionality. So an app shell is not a web API or a framework or anything, but just a design approach. Um, and again, it follows the principle of progressive enhancement. So we keep the shell of the application's UI separate from the content inside of it. They're loaded separately and they're cached separately. And this means that the initial load of a web application can provide the basic UI shell and then the content's loaded later. This results in a faster load time, but more importantly and more significantly, it also results in a faster perceived load time. So again, instead of staring at a blank white screen, a user can at least see like a background, maybe a nav bar, um, maybe like a spinning wheel and so on. And Google Inbox is actually an example of a web app that uses this model at a huge scale. So this process, and especially the caching involved, is assisted by service workers. And you can either write the shell from scratch or um, use a module called service worker pre-cache to basically write it for you. Um, this has been described as the purple pattern. Uh, basically, it's an approach that follows the following kind of order of operations. Uh, it does push, render, pre-caching, and lazy loading. So here's a snippet of what an app shell might look like. Um, as you can see, there's a link to the manifest at the top, some basic features to render in the body of the page, and a service worker that gets registered towards the bottom. So let's talk about service workers. Um, these come from the service worker API, and they're really just JavaScript. At the moment, they're supported in Chrome and Firefox, and they'll probably be supported in Safari soon, maybe. Um, they're event-driven, and they're designed to handle things like caching, fetching content, handling push notifications, and so on. And the key thing is that they allow for concurrent execution of browser threads and one or multiple JavaScript threads that happen in the background. So they basically work like a client-side proxy, and we can think of them almost like middleware. Um, they intercept HTTPS requests so that the app can decide whether to serve data from a cache, from like a local store, or from the network. Um, this means that service workers wind up performing expensive tasks without actually interrupting the user interface. But they can't access the DOM directly. So instead, uh, they communicate with the DOM through post message. Uh, and then other key points of contact include the cache storage API, the fetch API for making network requests, uh, and the indexed DB API for making data persist. Finally, service workers have lifecycle events and state. Uh, and these have an, a pretty extensive use of promises. So you register a service worker with the browser, then the browser starts installation, then if successful, the service worker continues on to activation. Once it's activated, it can actually start handling network requests, and then finally, if your service worker is idle for too long or if it becomes redundant, so if it gets replaced by another service worker, it gets terminated to save memory. Here is a code snippet of what registration kind of looks like. Um, so we can see our success and failure handler. That should be a totally familiar pattern by now. Uh, and then here's a snippet of what installation and activation plus some caching would look like. You can either write that caching manually or you can um, have a config file that does it. And then here is what event handling looks like. So finally, what does this mean for our stack? Like what can we do to optimize according to these principles? So. When I described running the Lighthouse tools on our Grace Shoppers site, we had a really, really long time on, until the first meaningful paint. <clears throat> and this is partly due um, to the fact that we're doing our uh, initial page load on the client side. 
So this kind of feels like the whole point of the front end frameworks that we've been working with, but we can actually tweak it a little bit to decrease our time to first paint by rendering, rendering our page on the server side on the initial page load and then handing it off to the front end. And in this approach, we can think of client side rendering actually as a kind of progressive enhancement. So in other front end frameworks, we'd potentially need a package to handle this. There are things like um, server side rendering in Meteor.js and there's like Lazo.js and Render. But in React, the ability to do this is actually baked in and it's pretty straightforward through the function render to string. Uh, it's a property of the React DOM. We do need to be careful about making sure our client side and server side have the same properties, have the same data to render, and this is a great use case for Redux. So here's an example of server side rendering using the render to string method. Uh, I had to break that up into two chunks, but basically the render fill page like passes that back from the server to the client side. And then here's what the client side would look like in response. Finally, we can um, at least move in the direction of making things more efficient um, by adjusting the way Webpack works according to the purple model that I described earlier. So the principle of like lazy loading means we wouldn't necessarily want to bundle all of our scripts into a 50,000 line file. Instead, the idea is that we would keep our code in separate files so that the app only loads pieces when they're actually required. So only when a user get, navigates to a new route does the app shell import those resources, either through a new request to the server or by loading it from the cache. And Webpack actually supports this using something called split points. It'll actually make multiple bundles that are much smaller. So finally, what's the payoff? So Twitter introduced Twitter Lite in April 2017, which is when we all started, which is exciting. Um, and it's a progressive web application that's designed to be used in regions that have like unreliable internet connections or especially slow connectivity um, or on devices that have limited storage capacity. It can load 30% faster and it reaches interactivity in under five seconds on like 3G devices. So if you've ever tried talk, um, throttling your connection in your Chrome developer tools um, and used like a good 3G connection, you know that's like actually pretty fast. Uh, plus it has up to 70% more efficient data usage. So the architecture of Twitter Lite is a node server uh, and then it's client-side JavaScript. They compile with Babel, it's bundled with Webpack, but again, instead of using a huge bundle.js, they have these granular pieces that only get loaded when necessary. They have Normalizer to handle API responses. We recently learned about normalization. Uh, and that sends them to Redux modules, which handle data and state. They use a service worker to pre-cache resources that are especially important, and then the UI itself consists of lazily loaded React components. So I hope my talk has suggested a set of um, criteria and questions to ask ourselves when writing our own web apps. How can we deliver content more quickly? How can we optimize user experience? And ultimately, how, like, what choices should we make when we're architecting our applications? I've started thinking about the implications of this basically every time I visit a website. Um, so if you're interested and you want to learn more, here is a set of resources. And thank you for listening.